Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. It's great to see you. My name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't all that familiar with CIS, we're a public policy research organisation that is primarily committed to weighing into areas of research on productivity, economics, education, culture, Indigenous affairs, and we're increasingly engaged in the China policy debates. In fact, just a few months ago, we hosted the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and the Australian Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, on the China question at the State Library, uh, shortly afterwards in Canberra, in front of an audience of more than 500 people, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer debated Professor Hugh White on Australia's choice in the increasingly intense strategic and economic competition between Washington and Beijing. And more recently, we've published some groundbreaking research from one of our scholars, Salvatore Babones, on our higher education sector's strong dependence on Chinese students. So we're very much involved in the China policy debate. And what a time, what an interesting time to be discussing China policy. Uh, in the past week, there's been a barrage of disturbing revelations and allegations about Chinese government espionage operations in this country, including uh, stories that Beijing tried to install an agent into federal parliament. That agent is mysteriously found dead. Uh, meanwhile, an extraordinary leak within the Chinese communist regime uh, in the New York Times, it shed new light on the brutal Chinese crackdown on ethnic Muslims in the western province of Xinjiang. And in Hong Kong, of course, we just saw earlier this week voters turning out in record numbers in district council uh, elections to elect pro-democracy candidates in what clearly was a repudiation of Beijing's attempts to rob Hong Kong of its political and legal autonomy. Indeed, a few hours ago, according to the Wall Street Journal, President Trump signed a bill showing solidarity with Hong Kong protesters, despite expressing reservations about its potential to complicate the China trade talks. Now, all this has taken place, of course, as Beijing has denied uh, uh, two Liberal MPs uh, a visit to China. And it's against this background that we are gathered here today for the launch, or the Sydney launch, of Peter Harch's quarterly essay, Red Flag Waking Up to China's Challenge. We'll hear from Peter soon. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce our special guest of honour here today. Uh, Julie Bishop uh, was Foreign Minister uh, from 2013 to 2018. Uh, she was the uh, Deputy Leader of the Federal Liberal Party from 2007 to 2018. And of course, a member, Liberal Member for the Perth seat of Curtin uh, from 1998 to, so 1998 to 20, uh, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julie Bishop. Thank you, Tom, and I'm delighted to be here at the Centre for Independent Studies to launch Peter Harcher's thoughtful yet provocative and timely essay, Red Flag China's Challenges. Peter, of course, is well known to you all. He's a renowned journalist. He has written and published extensively on national and international affairs. He's his commentary generally without fear or favour, and he always calls it as he sees it. And as Tom indicated, this essay is timely, uh, not least because of the recent media reports about very serious claims by a self proclaimed Chinese intelligence officer, in other words, spy. And I know that the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, and other security agencies will be working <laughs> to establish the veracity of these allegations. But nevertheless, this and other issues around foreign interference have certainly heightened the Australian public's interest in our relationship with China. Australia is a robust liberal democracy. We are committed to freedoms, the rule of law, human rights, democratic institutions. Indeed, this is our fundamental strength as a nation, as Peter so 
eloquently articulates in his essay, is our greatest strength under challenge? Well, according to the recently retired Director General of ASIO, Duncan Lewis, the scale and scope <laughs> Who's this for? <laughs> the scale and scope of foreign intelligence activity against Australia's interests is unprecedented. And he said, while not confined to China, the capability and intent varies greatly among those who are involved in this kind of activity. And he went on to say that foreign interference could pose an existential threat to Australia, given that its insidious long-term impact could take years to manifest. And the threat could well be in the form of a loss of faith in the integrity of our democratic processes, our voting system, indeed whether our elected representatives are subject to improper influence or control. And Peter has given some rather graphic examples of where and how this has occurred. Given that ASIO and also I note Nick Warner, the current Director General of the Office of National Intelligence, has also given similar statements before a Senate estimates hearing this week. Given these warnings, what is Australia's response? Well, let me take a practical response first. Clearly, we need to harden our technology infrastructure against cyber intrusion. And this means collaboration with our security agencies um, under the direction of the Australian Signals Directorate and the Cyber Security Centre in Canberra. That level of co collaboration and cooperation must extend across all governments, um, business, educational institutions and the like. And we must also, as a nation, develop our own and invest in and engage with best practice when it comes to the protocols and platforms to resist counter the kind of cyber attacks that we have seen and have experienced. And the fact is we are all responsible for our technology security. Within the political system, the foreign interference, intrusion, can take many forms. Political donations, candidate selection, intense lobbying. And Peter has, again, given very graphic and current and contemporary examples of this. It's incumbent upon our political parties to work exceedingly closely with our security agencies so that improper interference, improper behaviour can be detected early and countermeasures taken. We have also introduced legislation that has given rise to the Foreign Interference Transparency Scheme with a public register to give more transparency and accountability to the relationships that exist or will exist with foreign governments, foreign entities, corporations, individuals and the like. I think the parliament should also consider electoral reforms and one example would be in the more timely disclosure of political donations as we have seen in other countries. Now, we're trying to manage all of these issues while we are managing 
our economic and strategic relationships with great and powerful nations. For the first time in our history, as Peter points out, Australia's major trading partner is not also our major defence strategic and intelligence partner. And this gives rise to very challenging issues, as Peter has set out. The fact is the United States and China are currently in economic conflict. It's been called various things from a trade war to trade tensions, but they are in economic conflict and it has been coming for some time. There is absolutely no doubt that China's economic rise is nothing short of remarkable, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, going from a nation in the 1970s that was essentially isolated from the world to now the second largest economy on the planet, forecast to overtake the United States. Uh, with a corresponding rise in military and um, technological capability, its Belt and Road Initiative designed to connect the world through Chinese investment and Chinese influence. There's still a judgment to be made, and only time will tell, whether China's economic model will enable it to continue its economic growth and that trajectory. We've not seen such a centrally planned economy uh, that has a bias towards state-owned enterprises with a private sector that is subject to direction and oversight by the Chinese Communist Party or, as my Chinese friends call it, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And it's too early to tell what this model will eventually deliver. But the international community made a huge miscalculation back when China opened its economy to the world for it was assumed that China would also open up its political system and that it would embrace political reform and end up as some kind of liberal democracy. Well, that was never the intention. Uh, when the Chinese people showed signs of wanting greater freedom, we saw what happened with Tiananmen Square. And President Xi Jinping, I think it's fair to say, has doubled down on centralising control with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, when China entered the WTO, it subjected itself to global trading rules. And that meant that nations could invoke the anti-dumping provisions should Chinese products enter their markets at below the cost of production. Well, of course, that's precisely what happened. And the United States, being the largest consumer economy in the world, was hard hit. And so that conflict, the loss of manufacturing jobs, and even Paul Krugman, who's a great globalist, has admitted the sheer scale of the international transfer of manufacturing capability to China is beyond that which anybody had anticipated. The controversial pegging of the currency against the US dollar and other trade practices have led to this current standoff. And I can't see the US and China negotiating a free trade agreement to resolve the grievances they have this side of the 2020 presidential election. And both sides in the United States, both the Republicans and the Democrats, are promising the American public they will be even tougher on China as they make America great again. This isn't the only conflict. Of course, there's also the technology Cold War, and Peter refers to this in his essay. Uh, the fact is the United States sees Chinese technology companies as mere tools of the Communist Party and has blacklisted um, a number of Chinese companies. In response, China has created its own technological ecosystem its own um, infrastructure and operating systems and supply chains and standards. And this, of course, is going to come to an inflection point if those two systems, the American and the Chinese, are incompatible. And it's led the United Nations Secretary General 
Guterres to speak of the Great Fracture, where he says the world is splitting into two. The two largest economies are creating separate and competing worlds, each with their own dominant currency, their own trading rules, their own financial rules, their own internet and AI capability, their own zero-sum geopolitical and military strategies. Of course, it's not a Cold War in the USA-USSR perspective. China is not the former USSR. It doesn't operate in a parallel universe as the former Soviet Union did. The Chinese economy is integrated with the global economy. Chinese business people and investors and tourists and uh, students are all over the world. Nevertheless, the Great Fracture, as it's called, comes at a time when there is declining support for the international rules-based system that network of alliances and conventions and treaties and institutions underpinned by international law that has evolved since the Second World War is under strain. And from the unexpected quarter, the United States, which was the instigator, defender and guarantor of that rules-based order. So let me give you an example. The World Trade Organisation, a key institution in the rules-based order, is virtually inoperable because the United States is withholding funding, but also the United States is refusing to allow the appointment of new judges onto the appellate court of the WTO. And as of about this week, there's only one judge on that court and it needs two to operate. So no country, not Australia, not the US, not China, no one is able to have its trade practices grievances dealt with by the very body that was set up to resolve such disputes peacefully. So uh, where does this leave Australia? I believe that we must be a voice of reason and moderation and work with other like-minded nations, Japan, Canada, South Korea, India, Argentina, Brazil, the EU, uh, the UK, once Boris gets Brexit done and they can focus on other issues, to do two things. Encourage the United States to continue to be that defender, champion, guarantor of the international rules-based order. And Australia is undoubtedly a beneficiary of that order. A country our size cannot manage its relationships other than within a framework of international rules to give us certainty to be the open export-oriented market economy that we are. But secondly, in working with China, I have always found that you can raise sensitive and challenging issues with senior members of the Chinese government in face-to-face -face meetings, but that one must be clear and consistent in identifying what are the sensitive issues and where we see transgressions and ensure that China is fully aware of our views so that they're not taken by surprise when Australia adopts a course of action that may well have consequences. We have an extraordinary trading relationship with China, as Peter points out. It's one of the best trading relationships in the world. We went from two-way trade of $9.7 billion in 1997 to over $200 billion today. We're one of the few nations that has a trade surplus with China, Chinese students, Chinese tourists, add hundreds of millions of dollars to our economy. But we have different political systems. We have a different worldview on many issues. But we can manage those differences as we do with other countries. As I've pointed out, we have differences of opinion with the United States, yet it's how we manage those differences. And I do believe that Australia can continue to maintain its relationship with China while continuing to be a strong ally of the United States. Peter poses 
the question, uh, who would Australia choose between the United States and China? And I have to say, I am asked this question almost on a daily basis, who should Australia back? And I always answer, we back ourselves, our values, our interests, our priorities, our principles. And as Peter Harcher so eloquently put it, we always choose Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Peter Harcher, uh, as Julie mentioned, is one of our nation's most distinguished uh, journalists. He is the political and international editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, before that, he was the Asia-Pacific editor at the Financial Review, as well as a Tokyo and Washington correspondent for the Fin Review and the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, Peter's essay, as I said, Red Flag, Waking Up to China's Challenge. Copies are available at reception. Um, I had the pleasure this uh, week, along with my ABC colleagues, uh, uh, Lee Sales and Geraldine Doog, to interview Peter. And it's a great pleasure to welcome here to the CIS. Thanks, thanks Tom. And uh, thanks, Julie, for uh, honouring us with your thoughts. Um, it's a, I mean, I know who the star of the show is here today. And uh, <laughs> with, all, with all due acknowledgement to your, your star power, Tom, uh, it's Julie. <laughs> So I'm going to keep my remarks brief. Julie, thank you for getting us thinking about the Great Fracture. Australia has spent uh, a lost decade where we were thinking of the Great Fracture as the differences between Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, <laughs> as the differences between Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull, and then uh, Tony Abbott and Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, you, you know, it just becomes head-spinningly uh, pointless, uh, self-indulgent, distracting and destructive, which is exactly what's happened uh, to our country. So. Uh, Julie, thank you for getting us back to the, the real Great Fracture uh, and for uh, equipping us uh, to start asking the question. Uh, really, um, I just have, have a single simple point that I want to make, um, and it's the point of this essay. The initial pitch to write the essay that the publisher, um, the quarterly, quarterly essay, put to me was that, uh, you know, does Australia need to wake up to what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to us. And um, how can we do that? How can we wake up? But as the weeks went by, too many weeks uh, for my editor's liking, um, it, it struck me that Australia was well on the way to that wakening already. Um, concrete evidence, uh, the Turnbull government's ban on, on uh, Huawei participation in Australia's 5G mobile network, the foreign interference uh, laws passed by the Turnbull government with the full backing of the Labor Party. Uh, not that the Chinese government appreciated either of these. Um, they precipitated the, uh, the so-called freeze that we see uh, continuing to this day in high-level contacts. But um, the question is, once we've woken up, what do we do? This is the juncture that we now find ourselves at. Having awoken, um, from our torpor, our distraction, our denial that there was a problem, what do we do? What do we do next? Uh, and the dilemma is the same. It's a, the, the same old one we've been told about for years, and Julie referred to it too. Oh, you know, they're, but they're so, they're so big and they've got so much money. And, ooh, ooh. And, on the, and on the other hand, oh, yes, but they're, they're trying to intrude into our political system and take control of our, um, of our political system. So what do we do? Do we, do we engage for the benefits, or do we disengage for self-protection? Uh, my formula is simply that we do both. That we toughen our internal protections, protect our democracy, our system, our, uh, not only our democratic systems, but also our economic systems and our social systems against Chinese intrusion. Uh, having done that, we can then confidently get on with the other part of the equation. Instead of living in fear and, you know, the preemptive kowtow, oh, the Chinese will be angry with us, uh, which has been a tremendous piece of credulous, uh, sort of uh, willfully self-imposed servitude that Australia has fallen for, the theatrics of uh, the high-level um, noise box, the propaganda machine, which the Chinese like to call thought work, which I think is a very interesting <laughs> illustration of how they see it, and their thought work worked well on Australia. Um, Julie Bishop, as foreign minister, was often getting beaten up uh, because uh, she would resist the Chinese thought work. Uh, 
nobody seemed to pay any heed to the fact that the trade relationship would boom, continued to boom, even last year, where there was a minor panic every few months in the Australian media or political system about the China freeze. Two-way trade grew by 17.5% last, last calendar year between Australia and China. Um, so we shouldn't fall, fall for that. Uh, we should, having toughened our internal systems, we can then confidently get on with the engagement with the cooperation on all the really important issues where we must engage, not only economically. Uh, <laughs> you know, we do like this thing called an economy. We like our living standards. We can't do without that, realistically, politically. Uh, nor can we, you know, looking 50 years ahead, how do we conduct ourselves on uh, transnational crime, climate change, whatever the issue, without a cooperative working relationship with the region's dominant power? We have to do both. We don't want to be taken over by an authoritarian project, nor do we want to surrender a functioning relationship with the most important uh, power in our region. Let's do both. Uh, so let's, uh, let's toughen our system so we can engage confidently. Simple as that. Uh, but having said, having called it simple, uh, we all know that the execution uh, is, is, is the hard part. That's all I want to say. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming, and I think Tom's got uh, a couple of tricky questions for us in mind. Peter Harcher. This month marks the 30th anniversary of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and Francis Fukuyama, a uh, past guest here at CIS, famously declared the end of history, the triumph of Western liberal democracy. And the, uh, the conventional wisdom in Washington and Canberra, as uh, Julie mentioned, was that the more capitalist uh, China would become, the more uh, prosperous it would become, the more likely it would become uh, liberal and democratic. As you make very clear here in your columns and in your essay, that hasn't been the case. Uh, why were we so naive? We were naive because uh, it was convenient, because it meant that we could get along with uh, the trading side of the thing and put the whole political, ideological, Marxist-Leninist construct to one side and get on with business and make, making money. Uh, and we were conceited. There was an ideological conceit there that thought that our system must be the best and everybody inevitably will arrive at the same conclusion. So we don't have to worry about that. And my only uh, other point would be uh, that deluded the whole, the whole world, really, but the US as the sort of ideological and political uh, leader and thinker on all this stuff, for what, uh, 20 years or more mm. uh, into being, uh, you know, um, conveniently distracted. Many people would like to do the same thing again now based on another argument. They would like to defer uh, and prevaricate some years further by saying, we don't have to worry. The Chinese system has so many inherent problems, it's going to collapse anyway. Uh, there's an economic collapse coming, there's an environmental collapse coming, uh, there's a demographic collapse coming. Don't worry. Well, I would suggest that would be the same mistake on a different premise. We don't have the time. Uh, we see the relentlessness and the success of China's intrusions uh, around the world, including here. There's a member of the New Zealand Parliament uh, sitting today uh, who uh, spent 10 years working for Chinese intelligence. Uh, he didn't think it was relevant to disclose that fact before standing <laughs> for office in New Zealand. He sits today in the New Zealand Parliament. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is not going to stop, uh, and I don't think we should spend any more years wasting time either. But back to 30 years ago in the consensus, and Julie, you've been a prominent supporter of Western liberal democratic values, and indeed two years ago in Singapore, you gave a keynote address where you talked about how China would never reach its full potential as a regional leader unless it becomes democracy. Uh, many in the, the West would agree with you, uh, but uh, many people in East Asia have their doubts. Let's get a, a different reaction from Kishore Mabulbani. Kishore Mabulbani is a past guest at CIS, and here he is talking to me a year ago. Well, Julie is a friend of mine, but I'm afraid that I have to disagree with her. And my warning to the West is be careful what you wish for, because if China became democratic, I guarantee you, a democratically elected Chinese leader will be far more nationalist mm. and far more assertive 
than Xi Jinping is. Well, some and say Xi, that Xi Jinping's Chinese, already nationalist. He is. So in fact, but he mm. reflects in many ways a new assertive population in China. Mm. But fortunately, the Chinese Communist Party is strong enough to put a cock on Chinese nationalism and not allow it to explode. But if you had a democratically elected leader, the world would be a far more unstable place. In fact, the Chinese Communist Party is delivering a global public good by making sure that on balance, China remains a responsible stakeholder in the global system. Omar Bani, uh, one of Singapore's leading public servants and uh, intellectuals, Julie Bishop. Uh, I'm a friend of Kishore's and I agree and disagree with what he has said in that what I said in the Fullerton lecture was a statement of fact. It was not a criticism of China. What I said is history has shown that for a nation to achieve high income status, they have in the main been a Western liberal democracy, apart from some oil rich monarchies and a few uh, other uh, examples. The fact is history will show that high income status is achieved by democracies. My point being, if China achieves high income status and it's yet to show that its model will overcome the middle income trap, for example, but if China were to achieve that, it would be unprecedented. It hasn't happened before. Now, I thought it was a remarkably benign comment, but it was picked up by no less a authority than the Global Times, who <laughs> decided that, that I had said that unless China becomes a democracy, it will never reach high income status. That's not what I said. But uh, I agree then with what Keyshaw says about the potential for a democratic China to be an even more complex country to deal with, because you could see leaders and parties emerge on very nationalistic issues and take a very nationalistic approach to what they would see as China's core interests. Now, during your five years as uh, foreign minister, you were widely seen as tough on China. Um, uh, you've read the book p published by Peter. Um, to what extent are you surprised about these allegations and reports about uh, the Chinese espionage operations? Well, if being tough on China meant I stood up for Australia's interests on all occasions, well, then yes, I certainly did. But I hope I did that in relation to my dealings with every nation and uh, always put Australia's interests first. Uh, I think I received far more lectures from China than I ever <laughs> gave to China. But um, I'm surprised by the extent of Peter's knowledge of what's been going on, but as a member of the National Security Committee of Cabinet over the past five years from 2013 to 2018 and being exposed to classified briefings over that time, no, I'm not surprised. Okay, now let's change the subject. Uh, just last week, the former Labor Prime Minister, Paul Keating, gave an address at the Australian Security Summit. And this is what he had to say about the media. There's alarm in Australia at the scale and speed of China's rise. And this it comes out, particularly in the hysteria in the media, especially the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, but run up often clearly in the rear by The Australian. The Australian media has been recreant in its duty to the public in failing to present a balanced picture of the rise, legitimacy and importance of China preferring instead to traffic in side plays dressed up with the cosmetics of sedition and risk. Peter Hatcher, how do you respond to the former Prime Minister's charge that you and other journalists have indulged in anti-China hysteria? Well, first of all, I find it touching that uh, Paul thinks that an authoritarian great power like China needs a former Australian Prime Minister to spring to its defence <laughs> against the Australian media. That's touching. Um, <laughs> I also think that he's showing a great capacity to learn in retirement because he's adopted the same language as the Chinese Communist Party where uh, he describes, the, describes stories uh, in the Australian media as anti-China. Uh, and in that speech, that same speech that Tom's uh, just played for us, helpfully, thank you, Tom, um, Paul quotes that morning's Herald and says there are two anti-China stories, for example, in today's Sydney Morning Herald. And he called them anti-China stories. The first was the... Uh, 
international story of the New York Times getting hold of 400 pages of internal Chinese Communist Party documents uh, detailing how Xi Jinping had led the systematic repression of the, the Uyghur people of Xinjiang province. Uh, and that was a story that went worldwide. Now, that, according to Paul, is an anti-China story. The second one was um, a story by a correspondent who, had, uh, who quoted a politician in the Solomon Islands saying that Chinese agents were offering bribes of 200,000 Australian dollars equivalent uh, to Solomon Islands politicians to encourage them to switch Solomon Islands diplomatic recognition from Taiwan uh, to China. Now, Paul Keating says that also is an anti-China story. So anti-China, of course, the implication is that we shouldn't run it. Now, um, what do you think? Is, is our responsibility to keep the Australian public informed about the nature of this great power with which we are dealing or to censor ourselves uh, because we might upset them? And the final point I'll make before shutting up, uh, Tom, is that um, Keating also went to the question of balance. Uh, you need balance in portraying the country, the relationship. You're in denial about its importance and its legitimacy and its authority. Uh, so I got our editorial library to do a quick count. So far this year, we've done about 130. The Herald had published 130 stories uh, on the Chinese economy, about a third of those directly on the Australia-China uh, situation. So uh, if he wants balance, well, I, I submit to you that that's, that's okay, balance. OK, but isn't Keating's point, though, that all great powers do things to advance their interests and that compared to other great powers, China's conduct, all things considered, is relatively benign. You think about this, this is the point that many people in the business community will say, in the last 40 years, China has not fought a war, whereas the United States in the last year of Barack Obama's presidency, uh, this was in 2016, dropped 26,000 bombs on seven nations. So why are we so hard on China? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I see. Yes, we should all feel sorry. Uh, we should, no, look, it's ridiculous, right? Um, what's the metric... Uh, that we seek to apply here, that uh, we should forgive China whatever it does because it's uh, less bad than the Roman Empire or the Huns or... I mean, what's the metric? Of course, it's absurd. The metric is the welfare and prosperity of the Australian people. That's the absolute with, by which we should measure things. Uh, if the Chinese Communist Party is intruding on the welfare and prosperity and the, and the liberties of our country, then, of course we should react firmly against those. OK, now, this is uh, the former ANZ CEO, Mike Smith. He reckons that Australians are arrogant when they deal with China. Uh, they say that our leaders, especially Kevin Rudd and Julie Bishop, uh, lecture the Chinese. There have been no bilateral leaders or foreign minister visits for over two years. Now, some, such as the former ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, they say, um, Julie Bishop, you should accept responsibility for the poor state of the bilateral relationship with China. Your response? I would give some credence to Jeff Raby's views if he bothered to declare his many conflicts of interest. <laughs> However, as I said, I believe I received many more lectures from mm. the Chinese than I ever gave in return. I always dealt with them on a most uh, respectful basis. And what I said, I was always promoting Australia's interests and I had the same message both publicly and privately, the Chinese could never accuse me of taking them by surprise with a position because I was always consistent, whether it was on the South China Sea or air defence identification zones or a relationship more generally, I was always consistent. And I found that my personal relationships were very strong. Foreign Minister Wang Yi and I, after an initial dressing down that I received in front of the Chinese media who were then ushered out once I'd worked out what he was actually saying to me and tried to respond. Um, after that, we made it our business to get along very well and we did. And there were some moments where we worked exceedingly closely together, like over the disappearance of MH370, which was an issue that went to the very heart of uh, the... Um, Chinese Communist Party because of the number of Chinese who were lost and they had no answers for it. And Australia and China worked exceedingly closely on that issue. And that was through the personal relationship that I had with Wang Yi. So I reject entirely that um, I mishandled the China relationship in any way. In fact, um, I maintain very good connections uh, within China. But let me just say this. Um, China's practice of putting nations in the freezer 
is heavy handed. Mm. And Australia may be in the freezer, we might be at the door of the freezer, but other nations have been in that same situation and Peter, in fact, um, set them all out. It's how you resolve it. You don't cave in and um, suddenly throw all your interests and priorities and values and principles to the wind. You manage these issues as we do with every other nation. Now, um, the relationship with China is two-way, as our relationship with is, is with other countries. And both nations must decide to continue to work together for the betterment of our respective countries. And as Peter pointed out, even when... Um, Australia was supposedly in the diplomatic freezer, our economic and trading relationship continued to blossom. So China can draw a distinction, so should we. Now, perceptions about your foreign ministership obviously vary. You've got your rabies and your cars who will say that you were too hard on China, mm -hmm. but you did push hard for Australia to have an extradition treaty with China. Why? Because the... Chinese believed that they had an agreement with the Howard government, as they did, to uh, provide and guarantee consular services and consular access for any Australian held in detention in China, in exchange for which the Howard government promised an extradition treaty. And China at the time made it clear that they were focusing on ensuring that people charged with um, fraud and, and other um, financial uh, crimes could not um, escape overseas. So there was a deal between Australia and China. Uh, it was always, of course, subject to passage through the Australian Parliament. So I, in honouring the agreement that was uh, reached with China, uh, was part of a cabinet that put forward that mm. legislation. However, the Minister for Justice, who had Michael Keenan, who had carriage of that legislation, failed to get the support of the Labor Party and the legislation didn't go through. So it's a long-standing source of irritation with China, but it was an agreement in exchange for consular access. Now, Peter, in your book, you, you go to great lengths to talk about how the Chinese have tried to interfere in our internal affairs and you make it clear that the foreign uh, interference laws that were put in place with bipartisan support in late 2017 were appropriate, but you recommend more measures to uh, guard, better guard uh, our sovereignty against Chinese intrusion. What are they? Yes, and I'm happy to run through them. Uh, first, <coughs> let me just make a distinction that I probably should make at the beginning of every time I talk on this subject, which is that um, our, my concern is with an authoritarian <laughs> political project called the Chinese Communist Party. It's not with the Chinese people. Mm. Uh, and we have 1.2 million Australian Chinese who make, Chinese Australians who make uh, overwhelmingly positive contribution to our country. Uh, and uh, I'm not in any way uh, reflecting on yep. them, but I am talking about the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so first we should uh, uh, actually enforce the foreign interference laws, uh, which are not being enforced. It's a very tokenistic... Well, ask Tony Abbott so about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I rest my case. <laughs> um, second... Uh, as Julie, Julie picked up uh, one of uh, my uh, suggestions as well, which is we have to re re uh, the political finance system has to be reformed. Yes. It's, a, it's a Swiss cheese um, and foreign money, uh, even though it's uh, technically banned now, political donations in Australia uh, are banned. Look, just to talk to um, Huang Zhengmo uh, and his, the people that he was financing uh, here. So we need to fix that, fix that problem. Um, another simple an easy thing that we can do by way of toughening our own protections without waiting on any other country or taking you know, any particular mm. uh, uh, real difficulty is to do what Australians think we already do. Most people think we already screen new MPs and senators mm. for security clearances. We don't. Nor does New Zealand, obviously. Yes. <laughs> right, so let's, so let's learn uh, from the mistakes. Um, if you're an IT technician and you want to work in any government building, you have to have a security clearance. Mm. But you can enter our parliament, make our laws, run the system, and you don't need one. It's ridiculous. Uh, and as we saw again from the disclosure, disclosures by my, uh, my colleague Nick McKenzie and, and his team uh, at a company formerly known as Fairfax, now nine, in the last week, uh, since Dastiari has gone, the uh, Chinese system has continued to try to get uh, candidates into our parliament and will not stop. Let's have security screening. Simple measure. And a, yeah. 
I, Joy, I, I Joy was just Bishop. going to say, I, I always found it extraordinary that uh, I, as foreign minister, uh, had no uh, need for a security clearance. It was assumed by everyone around the world, and that's wonderful. But my staff um, had to go through the most rigorous mm. security clearances to ensure that they had top-level um Okay, what but, do you make of these? But no politician is ever subjected well, on that, to that. On that note, uh, Julie Bishop, what do you make of the scrutiny about the new Liberal member for Chisholm, uh, Gladys Liu? Uh, when these allegations were made, the, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, came out saying it was virtually racist to raise these issues. What, was your, what would your response be to the Prime Minister? Well, I uh, believe that uh, we should address concerns as they're raised. I, don't, I didn't see it being racist. I mean, you can't say that... Section 44 of the Constitution was racist. Yeah. I mean, that was all about your qualification to be a parliament, uh, be a parliamentarian, and some were able to read the Constitution and others weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that's the way it is. But it, it's like saying that was racist, yeah. uh, you know, against New Zealanders or something. It wasn't. Yeah. We'll go to questions very soon, but I just want to ask Peter and, and Julie a question about foreign policy because the Hugh Whites, uh, the Paul Keatings, the Bob Cars. Uh, they argue that China will relentlessly expand, that will eventually be in China's strategic orbit, and that America will retreat from the region. We're seeing signs of this, according to these uh, figures uh, in the Trump administration. Either Trump in a second administration or a Democratic administration will accelerate calls to uh, retreat America from Asia. They're war weary. They're tired of the world after all these endless wars in the Middle East. If they're right, what does this mean for Australia? Peter Harcher. Well, it means that we should uh, continue to get on with the task that we're slowly figuring out we need to get on with, which is to build a better independent capacity. Uh, we need to keep the US alliance, it's an, it's an Australian asset, uh, but recognising the trend, as you identify, Tom, uh, that the long run trend is for an American retreat. And we, we do need to be prepared for the, the day when we may have to go it alone. Uh, but That means increasing time, our defence substantially, yes, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, that 2% of GDP now would be going up to what, 4 Well, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, Hugh White says yes. Mm. Hugh White, in his work, uh, How to Defend Australia, says 4% of GDP is necessary. But at the same time, we have to do all that. We have to, after pr toughening our internal protections, get on with a thoroughgoing engagement with China okay. as a part of that answer. But Julie hasn't answered Well, I do, but no, I want to get Julie's response to this point because uh, the conventional wisdom in Washington still is that American preeminence in Asia will continue. Uh, in August, we had Professor John Mearsheimer uh, as a guest here at CIS, and, and this is what he told me. In a scenario where China is even more powerful than it is today, and the United States is consumed putting together a balancing coalition to contain China. Any country in East Asia that does not cooperate with the United States, and this would be especially true of a country like Australia, would feel the white heat of anger from Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam would go to great lengths to coerce the Australians or the Japanese or the Filipinos, whoever, into working with the United States to deal with China. As Professor John Mearsheimer, a leading foreign policy realist, uh, and this uh, bipartisan views he reflects in Washington, Julie Bishop. Well, we either get the white hot anger of Uncle Sam or the deep dark freezer of China, so I think we must have it right. <laughs> Because on average, it's just the right temperature. Right? Yeah, it's about the right but, temperature. But the point is, Look, it does I, make I it think, difficult, though, doesn't it? No, I think the reports of the demise of the United States are exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I still see the United States as continuing in its role, albeit in a different form depending upon the leader. But I still see it as being uh, the defender of the rules-based order. Yes, it's not perfect, and yes, it needs reform, and the United States is doing it in a pretty heavy-handed way, withholding funding and the like. But at the end of the day, the reason the United States is in so many conflicts around the world is because it is the only member of the Security Council that has the capacity to maintain international um, security, uh, if you like. And it's no bad thing that President Trump has called out NATO to lift its effort. It's no bad thing that the United States has called for other countries to shoulder the, shoulder the burden of being the global policeman. It's not a role China is seeking. It's not a role China would adopt, I suggest. Um, you're not going to see China intervening in some of these conflicts around the world where no other country but the United States has the capacity or the will to do it, and I believe that will continue. Now it's time for Q&A. First question, Angus Grigg from the Financial Review. 
Angus. There you go, Angus. Angus is a former China correspondent in the Financial Review. Angus. Thanks, Tom. Um, I might ask Julie Bishop, um, at what point do you think within this, within the Abbott-Turnbull government did attitudes harden towards China? Was it around the air defence zone, the South China Sea? Because there was a very clear turning point there. Can you just maybe sketch out for us how that played out? I, I, I would disagree. I, I think that our foreign policy position was pretty consistent and I would urge people to reread the foreign policy white paper that we released in 2017 because I think that summed up uh, very much the coalition's approach to foreign affairs, global affairs and the China-US-Australia uh, relationships. Uh, but there were issues in uh, the Abbott and Turnbull um, governments that irritated China from time to time. But they were issues that we would have taken in any event. For example, the unilateral imposition of an air defence identif identification zone over the Senkaku Daiyu Islands, um, whichever you call them, uh, was an issue that Australia should and would always, I would hope, call out because it was... Um, an attempt to destabilise the region. It certainly upset the Japanese. It um, caused more tension in the region, not less. Likewise, over the South China Sea, China does not appreciate our interest or focus on um, China's um, activity in the South China Sea. But as I've pointed out publicly and privately to the Chinese, it is very much in our national interest to ensure that there is stability and certainty and uh, the opportunity for um, overflight and and um, shipping transfers through the South China Sea because that's where the bulk of our trade goes. So we do have an interest in these things, whereas China would tell me it's none of your business, keep out of it. Peter Hatcher, if you look at the rise of great powers, the history of the rise of great powers, uh, as their power increases, their definition of their national interests increase. And they start to seek a sphere of influence in areas on which their prosperity and stability depend. We saw this with the United States in the 19th century when it intervened in Latin America. What's China doing that's so odd? Um, well, the community of uh, shared destiny uh, is the construct, the rubric under which China seeks to uh, establish influence. Um, and in one sense, what you're saying is absolutely right, Tom that it's, um, it's, a, it's a normal ambition of a great power to extend its, to extend its power. Um, but because it's normal for large states to extend its power over smaller, is that a, a reason that we should submit? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Next question, Monica Lewis. Good afternoon. Um, Julie Bishop, given in particular the revelations over the past week about Chinese influence in... Um, Australian democracy. What is your reaction to Kevin Rudd's suggestion that the coalition is using Chinese foreign policy as an instrument um, for domestic, as a domestic pawn? I reject <laughs> Kevin Rudd's assertions, as I've done on many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no more, uh, Peter. I mean, Kevin Rudd uh, launched your book in Canberra. How was your response to Monica? <laughs> Uh, you, you, you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm not a spokesman for Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Rudd, Tom. Andrew Lowe. Um, Peter, just being a devil's advocate, you talk about uh, Australia needing to wake up to the China challenge. Uh, do we really need to wake up? It's, I mean, it seems to me that our institutions are actually dealing with it very well. The free, the free press, our securities agencies, the parliamentary system, um, you know, actually are, are clearly unfolding on a daily basis uh, uh, things that come up when they come up. And in fact, the level of chatter about China and the China challenge in Australia is completely way above any other country, whether it's in Asia or Europe, uh, even even in the US. Um, you know, is it, is it really that we need to wake up or is it more that we need more nuance and uh, a bit more understanding of some of those differences between the Communist Party, China, the Chinese diaspora, uh, you know, the things on which we're aligned with China, the things on which we're not aligned with China, um, uh, etc. It seems like yeah, some people who've woken up to the China challenge uh, might, might be better off going back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I disagree with you on this, on this important distinction uh, that where you say that Australia is ahead of other countries, including the US, 
in waking up to the China problem, uh, the US is, has taken it way, way beyond uh, any conception in Australia about how to respond. Uh, all the media attention is on the trade war, but the US is now deep uh, under... Well, f first of all, it's, it's a bipartisan thing in the US now. It's one of the only things Republicans and Democrats agree mm. on is getting tough on China, mm. and you now have a competition to see who can get tougher. And it's not just a trade war. They're deep into a technological uh, war. They're deep uh, into um, uh, a strategic contest. And it's, it's uh, extending right across uh, the, the landscape. Uh, Donald Trump has now signed, as Tom mentioned, uh, just today, he signed the Hong Kong uh, Democrat... Uh, Human Rights and Human Rights Democracy Bill. And Democracy Bill. Thank you, Julie. Uh, you're out of politics, but you're <laughs> not out of the loop. Um, <laughs> um, there are 150 other bills before the Congress, uh, all of which are designed to uh, apply pressure to China. 150 bills across a whole range, academic exchange, um, uh, Tr uh, trade, uh, technology, you, you name it. Um, now, if we don't deal sensibly, calmly and practically with the Chinese Communist Party intrusion into our system today, we end up with something much more extreme, like the US response, which is an over-the-top uh, populist uh, contest now, mm. uh, or we end up with um, a a our own indigenous... Um, populist movement in the form of an anti-immigration backlash, uh, an, a racist uh, recrudescence uh, from the right wing of politics. These are all possibilities. If you don't deal with a problem logically and it becomes uh, overpowering, you get a backlash. And that is exactly the sort of backlash uh, that we need to prevent by being calm and rational now. And I hope and, hope and, hope and like to think that that's what I'm suggesting. Next question, Owen, a Chinese-Australian from Brisbane. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Peter, for uh, today. Uh, definitely is a good lesson for me. Um, uh, there's no doubt my understanding is that uh, as a nation, um, we will have more firm actions um, to react to China's uh, influence. Uh, my question actually goes to Julie. Um, uh, is there a, a framework to protect, uh, or, or a framework or protocol to protect the 1.2 million Chinese Australians leaving this beautiful country um, from this uh, keep rising public sentiment. Uh, and I can see probably even possible uh, witch hunt of spies. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's my question. And then uh, do you think that uh, 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 like uh, we as a, uh, uh, Chinese Australians have a role to play in our China policy? Thank you. Uh, most certainly, the Chinese community is uh, a very vital part. The Australian Chinese community is a very vital part of our society, of our economy, of our uh, life, our standard of living here in Australia, and um, we would not want that to change. When you say, is there a framework? Yeah, Australia's laws. We're all equal before the law, and uh, the, uh, the Constitution treats us all equally, and that's one of the strengths of Australia. We're a democracy. If we have um, elected representatives that get out of whack with um, popular sentiment, they receive the ultimate uh, job assessment every three years in the federal parliament. Uh, but I think that the uh, rhetoric is important. It should be, as I said, Australia should be the voice of reason and moderation in, in all things. Um, I don't believe there's a witch hunt to find Chinese spies. The guy that's in the paper is self-proclaimed. I mean, he, who he is or what he's about, I'm not in a position to give you any insights, but no doubt we'll hear about it in due course. Uh, so I don't believe that our intelligence agencies are stepping beyond their brief, beyond their mandate in any way. But that's why... Articles like Peter's are so timely. We have to have open, robust discussions. In fact, I would suggest that um, China, as an authoritarian regime, should be putting more faith and trust in the Chinese people to debate issues more freely, particularly the future direction of their nation. And that's what we treasure and cherish in Australia, and long may that be the case. Next question. Um, Sorry. Andrew Clonell from The Australian. Um, Julie Bishop, 
Andrew Hastie's kind of put his neck on the line a bit with this 60 Minutes report and, and nine newspapers report and basically said this guy in the papers, as you put it, has legitimacy. Um, should he have done that? What do you think of his actions in doing that? And um, does, you know, from your experience, um, what do you think of the veracity of the man's claims, so particularly with the Chinese government calling him a fraudster, etc.? Well, I would always caution people to make judgments prior to the evidence being gathered. And I understand that ASIO and the security agencies uh, more generally are working hard to establish the veracity of the allegations. Uh, the fact that he has sought to out himself raises fascinating questions because, in my experience, if there were truly a spy from any nation who had been engaged in such high-level espionage, that person would be enveloped within our intelligence community and would be nowhere near the media. Next question. Um, hi, uh, Marie from Vision China Times. Um, Duncan Lewis has mentioned that um, the Chinese community here can do um, a lot more and also get involved in um, uh, helping to counter some of the foreign um, interference. Um, in what ways do you see that happening? This is a question for um, Julie. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the Both. Well, actually, well, I, I think it follows on from the question here yeah. about what the Chinese community can, can do. Um, the Australian Chinese community should do what all other um, sectors of our community do, and that's engage in debate and dialogue, um, support politicians having a better understanding of issues. I mean, politicians are legislators, but they seem to be uh, expert in all areas, and they're not. And as we've discussed, there are no qualifications apart from Section 44 <laughs> to becoming a politician. So the more that uh, the community engages with our legislators and our policy makers, the more informed and nuanced it will be. I also think that uh, some of the great work that the Chinese community, and I, I apply this to other communities, uh, should also be brought to the attention of the public more often. And, and I think the media does a pretty good job in that regard. I... Um, happen to disagree with Paul Keating's assessment of the Australian media. I think that uh, we get a pretty balanced uh, approach. And in fact, um, my one complaint as foreign minister with the media used to be that the Australian media always assumed that I was mishandling the relationship and yet the Chinese media never suggested China was mishandling the relationship. <laughs> and I thought, come on, Australian media, do your job. Stop you know, just assuming that it's always the Australian leadership that's at fault if there's an yep. issue with China. Next question, John Connor. Uh, yes, um, going back a little in time, do either of you think that uh, perhaps the Chinese may have been encouraged in some of their beliefs by the extraordinary agree early agreement of the Australian government uh, to the proposition that Australia was a market economy as a precondition for entering into the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement? That China, China was a market, market economy. Market. Sorry? That China was a market economy. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, you said, you said Australia. You meant China. Yeah. I meant that, well, Australia had recognised yeah. China the as a market economy in 2001. as a precondition to that agreement, which some of us at the time found truly astonishing. Well, I don't think we were alone. I think that uh, China's accession to the WTO in 2001 uh, was supported pretty well universally because people saw it as... Uh, China opening its economy, therefore it's going to be opening its political system, therefore it's going to start behaving like uh, a liberal democracy and we know how to deal with them. And I think that that was uh, just one of the uh, miscalculations that was made generally. But, uh, I mean, the United States should have woken up to that pretty quickly because, as I mentioned, it was the US that, that really um, copped the, the full impact of China in the WTO. I mean, there's a, there's a statistic. In the four years from the time China entered the WTO, uh, 230 US furniture makers went out of business. 50,000 jobs were lost because the American people chose cheaper Chinese products over the American products, and it went from 3% of the market to 60% of the market. Now, there was a lot that the US administrations could have done at the time, but neither Bush nor Obama took any punitive action. Now we've got uh, President Trump uh, mm. saying he's going to be tough on China. So the moment passed. OK, we've got time for one more question at least, uh, quickly. Yes? I'm sorry, I don't know you. Uh, Linda Javen. Oh, um, hi. 
G'day. Hi, John. Um, my question is, I love the, the piece. I thought it was brilliant. And um, your analysis that we need to strengthen our democracy, that we need to protect ourselves, but at the same time to engage. Now, you do mention that there's, uh, I think you call it a big, rich arena for shared enjoyment in sport and, in, and uh, the arts. What I want to know is what is the role that cultural engagement can play and what should it play in this bilateral relationship? Well, uh, thanks, Linda, and, and you know all about uh, and you know know all about the cultural arena. Uh, yeah, Linda is a, a very distinguished author in her own right on these subjects, and yeah. uh, she writes for the Quarterly Essay quite a bit. Sorry, yeah. Peter. Yep. Uh, I just um, one quick thought on that, and another uh, thought on the previous question about the role of the uh, Chinese Australian community. Um, the cultural sphere can be fantastic, not just for the exchange uh, uh, and you know enrichment of each other's cultures. But for us to decode the meaning uh, of red culture, as it's called, the, the communism, uh, the Communist Party's uh, infusion of Chinese culture with political and ideological meaning, uh, is a wonderful way for Australians to come to understand that ideology, how China thinks or how the Chinese government uh, would like everybody to think, and to contrast our system with theirs, as well as uh, to share and to absorb and to learn. Uh, so I think it's actually a terrific um, sort of Rosetta Stone, if you like, for helping the West and including um, Australia, if I may include Australia in that definition, uh, to interpret what otherwise is just um, interesting art. And on the Chinese community in Australia, I would just say that at the moment, uh, we uh, as a, a government and governing and political system um, and a community uh, are not helping the, the uh, Australian Chinese community, because the United Front Work Department of the Chinese government, which is a subject which miraculously is almost never mentioned, even though it is an established department of the Chinese government. I've been there. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> oh, Julie, do you have something you want to tell us? <laughs> I'm just surprised you'd never asked me before. <laughs> well, don't let me stop you. Just please spill it out. Um, so no, I'm just confirming... It exists. Yes, absolutely. In, fa in fact, the president of China, Xi Jinping, has called it one of China's three magic weapons. So if the president talks about it publicly in those terms, maybe we should take an interest. And I'm glad yeah. that the former foreign minister has. But the reason that's unfair to the uh, Australian Chinese community is that the United Front Work Department has set up and infiltrated hundreds upon hundreds of organisations in Australia uh, under the guise of community organisations, homeland organisations, patriotic associations, student associations, business associations. Uh, according to Pref Professor Feng Chong Yi from the University of Technology, Sydney, at least... Oh, hello, Professor. He's here. He's here. Oh, there, he there, is. Is. Yep, yeah. there you are. Well, I invited him, yeah. <laughs> Correct me if I get, get your quote wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> the eminent professor said that there are more than 300 such groups in Sydney alone and hundreds more across the country, uh, organised or infiltrated by the United Front Work Department. Now, those organisations put pressure on uh, members of the Chinese-Australian community to side with them, and that means to side with a foreign power. Uh, they need help. They need help to be able uh, to, to get away from that pressure, to relieve that pressure to betray the country in which they've chosen to live many of whom chosen to take citizenship, chosen to bring up their kids. The foreign interference laws are designed to do that, but they're not being enforced. If they are enforced, that will be uh, a tremendous help and a relief to hundreds <coughs> of thousands of Chinese Australians who are uh, feeling conflicted, pressured and anxious. We need to reinforce uh, the value, the importance and the priority of our own community and our own democratic beliefs over those of a foreign power. Julie, final word? Well, as I said in my remarks uh, in launching Peter's essay, Australia must always be true to its values, its interests, principles, priorities. And I do believe that Peter's final um, line, that we must choose Australia, holds true. And while we are walking a tightrope, we're not the only nation on the planet doing so and that I believe with the kind of um, open, robust discussion that this essay and others um, will provide, 
uh, we can have a mature and sophisticated relationship with both the United States and with China, as we should with all other countries that so significantly affect our interests. A good way to end proceedings. Please thank our special guests, Julia Bishop and Peter Harker. That's great. Well done, mate. Very good. Thanks, Thanks Julia. That was terrific.